Praise the Lord, everybody. How are you doing today? You glad you came to church this morning? You know, less people are coming to church than ever. It's really good to see you here. <laughs> you don't get quiet on me. It's all true. And I was listening to, we live in a day, we live in a day of technology, don't we? Technology is exploding everywhere. Got a phone here in my back pocket. Don't really need a, a book to preach out of anymore because it's all in here. And uh, so we're living in quite an exciting time. And but sometimes I think because we're just doing life or doing whatever we do, we, we sometimes fail to stop and realize really how exciting it is. Everything in the world is shifting and changing around us today. And it has been. We're not just be at the beginning of it anymore. It's been happening for years now. In the States, since we had our last election, I know you guys had an election. I mean, just you can just see God's hand in the world. Not just at church anymore. Not just in whatever we're doing you know, spiritually, but just in the world. It's a, it's a changing time. So it requires from us like an alertness and an awareness of what's going on around us. So I want to encourage you today. Be aware more than ever. And of all things, be aware of the Lord. Be aware of the fact that you have a Bible. Be aware that you don't just go to church. Hello? You are the church. You, wherever you go, that's where the church goes. The church goes with you. and we're, We don't go to church. So this is a day to, to just really rise up, stand up, be counted. It doesn't matter if you have a big reach or a small reach. You don't have to be like anyone else. You don't have to measure up. We sing all these songs about guilt and shame. And then we go out and we live lives, you know, in competition all the time to build more guilt and shame. And the church goes through this ringer, in and out. We're trying to figure out, like, what is it exactly that God you know, wants us to do? Well, if we really have a heart to want to know Him, His will, like Pastor Neil was saying, not our own, I believe that this is an hour when it's really not going to be all that hard. Because as things are happening, you just start to step into what's happening. And you let God do what He wants to do. Amen? So it's a pleasure to be here. I always love to come here. I think Bobby and I were here a little less than two years ago. I think we were here in October of 2017. And um, I kind of like to just pick up where I left off, if you don't mind, when it comes to preaching. Of course, you all know exactly what I was talking about two years ago. Yeah? Neil knows. I remember last time we came here, I was actually talking about the lost city of God. And that was on my heart because flying over, you know, you have a lot of time in the 14-hour in the flight or whatever from L.A. to here. You have a lot of time to, to do a lot of different things. Most, most of the time we're watching movies or whatever, just trying to spend the time. But I remember on that flight, I watched a movie called The Lost City of Z. And I like archaeology. I like history. I've always been like that as a kid. So that caught my attention. I thought, well, this will waste two hours of time. This will be good. And so I began to look at this story, and it's a true story of a, a British uh, explorer back in the late 1800s, his name was Perry Fawcett. And to make a long story short, he found a lost city in the Amazon jungle. And he was so excited because, like me, he loved history. His whole life was about that kind of thing. And so he found a city underneath the jungle. Isn't it amazing how the jungle can just overgrow anything man can do or make? In fact, it's so true that we don't even know, as, as believers today, we've lost touch with the fact that, you know, there was technology before. Did you know that? I said that to a lady in my church, and she just shook her head and started mumbling. You know, she just thought Noah built the ark, you know, just out of no technology, just kind of hobnot, you know, just cobbled it together and somehow made it through, and God blessed him, and hello? We don't realize, man, there's been technology on the planet before, but a lot of it grew over because of God's technology. What Darren Begley was talking about the other night, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, it kind of overrides everything else. And so even a plant, even a tree right, can just grow up and swallow whatever we can build and make. And we go to Egypt and we look at those pyramids and we, we start to realize there's actually pyramids all over the world. There's pyramids in the ocean. And we forget, you know, we're just, we're not in touch because we're just aware of what we're aware of. And we forget that, you know, like there's a much bigger world than we realize. You know, I was watching a show on the History Channel several years ago, and they were showing how they took the biggest truck that man has. And this truck could only carry one of the, not, not the biggest stone, 
of the Great Pyramid. It could only carry it at one or two miles per hour. It could just barely move with one of the one of the larger stones, but not even the largest stone in the pyramid. The biggest truck we have was just like barely moving. And we think, you know, like we forget God is a big God. So I was watching that movie, and when I got over here, that's what, you know, that's what created the sermon. And, and then coming back, I thought of that again. I was like, you know, this, this amazing thing I, God started to show me. You've lost touch. The, the church has lost touch. It's lost touch with its own history. Lost touch with its own past. You're going to talk to me about, you know, the church has lost touch with, there's a lost city in the church. The lost city of Zion is the lost city of God. It's an amazing study when you, just begin to think about Zion in the Bible. We talked all about that last time, so we won't go back into that, but that was just fresh in my mind. And You know how God was saying, like, you know, he, he called out a people, did an amazing thing. I want you to go to the book of Hebrews today and go to chapter 8 with me. If you're reading the book of Genesis at chapter 11, you, you see that there's a, like a big contrast in this one short chapter in the Bible. And so this is after man has come out of the flood. And a lot of the technology we've lost touch with it was because it got buried in the flood, right? Some of it, like I said before, is under the ocean now. Are you glad you came to church today? I'm just trying to whet your appetite for starting to think about what it is you might not know. You know, there's a thing called a normalcy bias. Psychologists know all about it, but all of us as humans, just like Pastor Neil says, all of us are like the rest of us. All of us have a tendency to sit like this when we hear new information and say, oh yeah, I don't know about that. It's just hardwired into us as human beings. I don't know about what I don't already know about, and, I don't, and I'm not sure I want to know about what I don't already know about. It's called a normalcy bias. It's, it's, it's been around forever. You know, we hear it for the first time, but, and all of us know it's true, don't we? If, listen, husbands, ask your wife if you don't believe me this morning, if that's true. Wife ever tell you something, and you're like, I don't know if I believe that. People are in divorce court over stuff like this. It's just a normalcy bias. That's all it is. Once you know it's there, then you can catch it before it becomes a problem. The next time you, you start to fight against something God's trying to do or God's trying to say or, or something that God's made you a part of and you know, he wants you to move forward, and not, and not be stuck or not go back. You go, oh, wait a minute. You know, I can do something to assist that. I can, just, I can just be pliable and flexible. This is a pretty good sermon today. I mean, it's just getting started, but really, it's pretty good. Save you a lot of time right there. The normalcy bias. You know, if you just did a study in psychology of all the biases that we have, we might be able to do something about all the biases they're trying to give us in the world today. You know, in America, they're trying to get everybody to be against everybody. And you, if you watch the news or anything, which I never do, it, it, for any reason would I ever do that. I never watch the news. I don't, care what, I don't care to have in my life what the world wants to tell me to believe. I, I, want, I want to make sure that I have a heart full of what God wants me to say and do. And I want to be able to move the mountains He needs me to move. And I want to go forward and not get stuck. But if you listen to that, you know, they tell you that, you know, everybody's against everybody. But then when you really go out in the real world and walk around and travel around and go to different cities, you realize this is not true at all. Is that black people are against white people. White people are against black people. Mexican people. We've got to build a wall in America's Mexican people, you know, are like flooding in somehow. And, and most of it's not even true. But we're not sure. But we just kind of, we're so used to just kind of going with the flow we don't realize reality is bigger than we knew. And so when I came here last time, I was talking about the lost city of God, or just the lost city of Zion, and how, how, you know, just from Genesis 11, God calls out Abraham, but, but really it's just right after the world gets right back up after the flood and, and, and follows Nimrod and tries to build a tower into the heavenlies. This went right back to try to do what they had done before. And, and this, is the world's, this is the world's system is being built. And, you know, what we call the world in the New Testament, that's what, where it all comes from. It's back there in the Bible. It was being built. Man has a tendency to do things, you know, their own way, not God's way. 
If you live as a Christian in the flesh, you'll, that's what you do. You just you fight against all the time. You're resisting all the time. Resist yourself and don't realize it. Resist other people and don't realize it. Resist God and don't realize it. But it's through these little subtle things that we don't realize that we're doing, like a normalcy bias. Somebody told you it was normal and you just kind of went with that and you forgot to check out the information. See, God wants to do something different today. In Genesis 11, it starts off with the story of Nimrod, the Tower of Babel and all that. And then God sees what they're going to do. And it's almost like God's shaking his head like, didn't we just deal with this? Didn't we just go through all this? The imagination of men's heart was wicked continually, remember? Before the flood. And that's what happened. And there's so many things that happened in the flood that we don't even know about. The detail, a lot of the details are left out, really, at least in the Bible that we have. We're not even sure. What, but God just sums it up and says, listen, it was basically a a humanity problem. People wanted to do earth without God. It's the same thing that goes on today. So, so God came down. He looked at the Tower of Babel. He estimated the situation, and he did something about it. He didn't flood the earth this time, but he separated people. He separated their tongues so it wouldn't be as easy for them to gain unity and to work together. On the day of Pentecost, God reversed that for the people of God. So that we could now talk to him uninterrupted. We could move with each other uninterrupted. But you ever notice how many times we come to church and we still have an awkward atmosphere around us? Because we've lost touch with these things. We know them, but we know them in a way that we're really not thinking about them. When we come to church like this today, we have the greatest opportunity to do what they did in the book of Acts. But usually when we're here, we talk about why the book of Acts isn't working anymore. We ask questions. But you know, we are the church again. When we come together, God is in the midst of us. One can put a thousand to flight, but how many can two? That's the book of Acts. The book of Acts is like, you know, the most, the most amazing miracles in that book didn't happen when there was just one famous guy or another famous person. It's when the whole came together. Because the whole is Christ. He's the head and we're the body. I just kind of have this on my heart today. I hope it's okay. When the whole comes together, anything is possible. Anything is possible today. The only reason we don't believe it is because we got talked out of it. Our mind has been being used, you know, to calculate other information other than what God wants us to think about. Darren Begley did a good job the other night talking about think on these things. Walk in the Spirit. Give God an opportunity to do whatever He wants to do. You know, just, just kind of put yourself in a different position. You don't have to be super holy. You don't have to be super special. You don't have to become something you're not. It's just kind of like letting go and saying, let's go God's way. I believe this is what the Lord's saying. You know, I think He was saying this a couple of years ago when I came here. And He's still saying the same thing. He's like, come on, man somebody's just going to open up and do it. There's going to be churches that just say, you know, let's just do that. We're watching this movie about Queen Victoria on Netflix or something. You know, it was one of these English movies. And, and it was a true story about some Hindu guy that came and worked in her court. And, but the thing, that I, the thing that was so funny is that she was so sick of, of it all, of all of it. They would wheel her out. You know, she could barely hobble around. And, they, you know, everybody would go silent. The queen's here. And all the little guys dressed in their little red suits would do all the things that they did. You know, people would stand at the right time, sit down at the right time, ring a bell at the right time. You know, the English are really good at all that. <laughs> we get tired of that in America. Just told them to go home. Just... Never quite understood why they, but you know, they were formidable force army, but you know, like, how do you fight battles wearing those kind of suits in the jungle, man? I, that never made sense to me. So Queen Victoria would be wheeled out, you know, and her, I don't know if anybody's seen this movie, I forget what it's called. Anyway, every time they wheeled her out, her eyes would just roll up like, oh my God, is it over yet? And it made me think about church. That's what we do at church. That's what we do in the Christian, the culture we built around Christianity. That's what we do. We're all sick of it. Is it just over yet? Is it over yet? In America, we're the worst, man. We'll just do it over and over and over and just wear out the welcome and do it again and again. I was telling Neil the other day, there's 41,000 
Protestant denominations. And that's just what they think. Because there's so many, they can't quite figure out how many. 41,000 ways that we've splintered ourselves, and it's the devil's plan so that we never figure out what we're supposed to be doing because we don't know who we are. We don't really know what we're doing. So, you know, we can just keep going to church forever, or we can just start being the church. We can just go, hey, listen, we got a great opportunity today. Let's just get together and let's just worship Jesus. I find in America, when you tell people this, they're resistant to the idea. The normalcy bias kicks in. They're like, oh, I know all that. I've heard all those sermons, you know. But, you know, they never read their Bible. The stats say that Americans never read their Bible. I'm talking about Christians. They don't read the Bible. And you come to church, and that's how you get the atmosphere. Because you have not been working the ground of your heart so that it's good ground. So that the seed can be placed in. So that no matter if you heard the sermon a million times, if Pastor Neil preached a sermon you've heard over and over and over, but today's going to be different because my ground's different. And so, you know, this is not a sermon about what's wrong with the church. It's a sermon about what's right with us and trying to get to the place where we're like, we actually believe it again. So Perry Fawcett fought through the jungle, you know, tore out the vines, Neil, you know, through the rainforest. I've been running with Susie every morning down through the little rainforest you have down here, you know. And, uh, and that's formidable enough. You get off the beaten path, I'm like, wow, you know, like this is, this is gnarly in here. This is, I don't want to be in here. And so he went through there, and what did he find? Underneath the ground, you know what he found? He found that there was concrete, like concrete roads. Today, you know, they've done so much more of this. Now they've gone over with the satellites and the, you know, the the heat-seeking, whatever. And they realize that in some of these places, they're like 12 and 20 square miles of stuff under the ground. You know, there's a city in America right outside of Dallas that has a 20 square mile wall under the ground. Is that amazing? It's amazing. But you know, the Bible tells us, you know, as in the days of Noah, it's what's going to be like when Jesus comes back. And then today we're living in all this technology and we see what it's doing and we're like projecting, extrapolating forward. What's it going to be able to do? They're going to put the, the phone in your head soon. Soon. I'm not saying they will. I'm saying they're planning to. You don't have to go out and... You don't have to go out and guess about anything today. All the information comes to you because you see the enemy has been working all these years, all these generations to get the unity back so he can do it all one last time. He wants everybody to be able to communicate. I went to Ecuador last year and uh, it was so much easier than the last time I had been to South America because the phone has translator on it now. I don't need to learn the language I just say blah, 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 and just put the phone to somebody else, and it interprets for me. Don't even need a bad interpreter. You ever have a bad interpreter? You ever seen a bad interpreter, right? Oh, my gosh. They make you not want to be a preacher anymore. You know, you get all fired up. You, you come in. You've been with God, but the interpreter, you know, <laughs> he hasn't. Sometimes they find the guy that's like, how's this guy an interpreter? He can't even speak his own language well. You see, if we can never get to this place where we can start to realize, so, so, okay, come back here to Genesis 11, right? Nimrod builds a tower. I'm going to come to Hebrew. Nimrod builds a tower. These guys know, Neil. They were here last time when you were here. They know. We don't. We use the Bible, but you know what I mean? It's for you to go back and check it out, see if I'm right. They build the tower. God comes down. God says, not going to work. We're not doing it again. But in the goodness of God, he separates everybody around the whole earth. That in itself is an amazing miracle. That's how you get people everywhere on the planet. But then when you get to the end of the story, right at the very end of the chapter, then it says God chose Abram. He found one man and he said, I'm going to do it this way. The world always does it this way. We always try to do it big, flashy. You know what I mean? That's how our churches have become like nightclubs today. Hello. Yeah, not, not that everything that we do at church is wrong, but you know, just the general way that we do it like the world should tell us that God's got a better way than that. 
you're the way. I'm the way. We're the way. We get together. Right now, today, anything's possible. God could do anything. He chose one man, and he began to do his thing. Nimrod's the world system, the Babylonian system. You can find it all the way in the book of Revelation. It's still operating today. It's an operating system. Just like your computer operates an operating system, your smartphone, all these devices you have, they have platforms, they have to operate. The world is an operating system in the supernatural sphere. The, this earth was never built to just be completely natural. It was, it was seamlessly interwoven with a supernatural platform. God made man in his own image, like Darren Bagley said the other night. God made man like himself and said, go have dominion. And man operated supernaturally. And so when, when, as the world built that system, then God came back and said, this is how I did it in the beginning. This is how I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it my way. Let me take a man again. And so he takes Abram. And he just slowly and consistently begins to build his word, his promises. He begins to work with them, and he calls them out of Ur of the Chaldees. He calls them out of the midst of Babylon. You know, in the end days, the Bible said that the church is going to have to come out of her, out of her what? Out of that system. Colossians chapter 2, Paul said it himself that the church tends to operate within that system. The church likes to do orderly arrangement, ordinances, rituals, all the things we're talking about. Are we tired of that yet? And Paul said, none of that stuff is what God has in mind for us. God has in mind for us, you come with me, you walk with me, I'm going to take you where I want you to go, and I'm going to accomplish my will. How many people know God's will will be accomplished at the end of the day? The devil doesn't even matter. God has already taken him into consideration from before the foundation of the world. He knew everything that he's going to do. God made a better plan. Has, it's, it's all in there. That's how come we can have such confidence. At the end of the day, God's with me. Who could be against me? God's with us. Who could be against us? Nobody. But we've got to get this back in our thinking. You know, when Jesus spoke to, said, speak to the mountain, right? Remember the story, Mark eleven twenty three. 23, when he said, speak to the mountain, we get our mind on mountains, okay? He's talking about a mountain. He's really not talking about a mountain in the way we think. What Jesus was talking about is he came to Israel in a moment. He came to his own people, and they, they didn't recognize him or want to recognize him. They were actually a blockage to what God wanted to do. He was dealing with that mountain. And as he dealt with it, you know, we see the story over through the money changers' tables. He cursed the fig tree. All these things were a big story. I'm not saying if you had a mountain in front of you that you had to move that you couldn't move it because the word is true. But when Jesus comes down and he says, hey, you can speak to these mount you, this mountain, and if you do not doubt in your heart, but you believe that those things you say will come to pass, you will have whatsoever you say. When was the last time you heard a sermon on Mark 11, 23? Yeah? What's he talking about? He's talking about make sure to move the mountains in your life. Don't be a part of a mountain, and don't let the mountains build up in you. Move them. You can move them. We all have mountains in our lives today, or the church would be doing a different set of things. We all have mountains. Move the mountains. Just begin to say, okay, I'm going to do it simply the way the Lord began to lay out to me. Speak to your mountain so you have to identify it. Begin to speak to it, and then say to your mountain, I do not doubt in my heart the things I'm saying to this mountain. But I believe that the things that I say will come to pass. I will have them. Two verses later, he identifies what one of the biggest mountains are. It's unforgiveness. The biggest mountain is unbelief. It's un-God, un-God, un-God. We're tendency, we have a tendency to be wired anti-God, human, carnal, that's the mountain. Jesus said, speak to that mountain. Man, you don't have to be like just the natural you. Speak to the mountain and do not doubt in your heart, but believe things that you say will come to pass. And what will happen? You will have. I go to churches, right, and I see people have problems with people. 
and then they want they, they would like to do something for God, but you can't because you have a big mountain in your way. It's a big mountain of unforgiveness in your life. And you don't know how to move it because you kind of you've gotten you may not be reading the Bible, you may not be looking at these things right, you know, you may be looking at them in the context of what somebody else said to you. We just need to come back to the simple way. It's the world system versus God system. The world always does it like, hey man, we're all getting together and we're gonna do it without God. And God always does it in the way you would think last. He's always like, this one guy, leave Babylon and I will show you where to go. I will show you what to do. I will walk you through it step by step. And of course, we all know that's what Abraham did, right? That's what he did. He went, and you know, the Bible says he wasn't even looking for a promised land. He wasn't looking for a city. Like, you know, the, the children of Israel got the promised land under Moses, kind of, under Joshua. The judges, the kings, they never really got their hands around it. But you know, Abraham wasn't even looking for the land. He went to the land. He was walking in the land. But he was never really about the land. You hear today? You know what he was about? He was about the call. He was about God. It was to him, it was, I'm following God and wherever he's taking me, you know, whatever he's going to do. His word is true. He was learning to trust. He was learning to be pliable. He was learning to be open. He was learning to be flexible. He was learning to just go with God. And that's what it's all about. Listen, no matter what your problem is in this life, write this down today. If you'll just grow a little bit every day, you'll, you'll, you'll end up fixing every problem. If you'll just grow a little bit every day, and what I mean by that is grow with God. Talk to Jesus every day. Read the Bible every day. Stay open every day. If you miss a day, that's fine. So, you know, don't get all under condemnation and shame. You know, Repent, go back and say, Lord, I'm sorry I'm human. I do dumb things. Forgive me. I, I still love you and I still want your way in my life. So simple, right? Re you know what religion is, right? It's superstition. Religion is that. If you look it up in the Bible, it's, the words are like synonymous. Isn't it? Religion is when you come in and you're like trying to outguess God. You're like, oh, the clock was at 11.11. God's talking to me. So, and you know, sometimes God does this, right? But you don't live like that. You live in relationship with him. You don't live like trying to figure out, you know, like what's the next superstitious thing that might happen to me? We're keep keeping our eyes on him. There's a verse here in, in Hebrews chapter 8, and I know I don't have that much time today, but look what it says in verse 1. Now, this will save you reading seven chapters of the book of Hebrews. No, it really won't, but it sums it up for you in chapter 8. It says the main point is this, verse 1. I'm reading from the Amplified. The main point of what we have to say is this. Wave your hand if you want to know what it is. The main point is what Christians need today. What's the main point? What is the main point of what we're doing? How do we know if we get there? The main point, the writer of Hebrews said, is this. We have such a high priest, or such a great high priest. Of course, that high priest has been being talked about in chapters 5, 6, and 7. The Bible said Jesus is a high priest, but not after the Levitical priesthood or the Aaronic priesthood, not after the law of Moses, Jesus is a great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. You ever notice you don't hear too many sermons on Hebrews? You don't hear too many sermons on topics like Melchizedek, but it's a big one. It's a big one in the Bible. The book of Hebrews is written in about like 65 AD, 62 to 65 AD. So if you're thinking about chronology of the book of Acts, right, this is just a few years before the Romans are going to come and destroy Jerusalem. And now Josephus, a Jewish historian, said it was one of the, if not the most brutal sieges in world history. Jesus said on his way to the cross, don't weep for me, weep for you. Did he? What was he saying? He was saying, listen, man, you have rejected something here and there will be there will be a payday. And it was, it's, it's interesting to me because it's like it's 40 years later, just like the children of Israel wandered around for 40 years in the wilderness trying to go into the promised land. And so 
Josephus said somehow the church, like, all got out of Jerusalem before 70 AD. They, they all heard God. God warned them. In his writing, it said many of these Christians went to the area of the Decapolis, and that's where they went. They just literally got out of Jerusalem. They were shown ahead of time by the Holy Spirit. Judgment's coming. And, but it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, a huge negative. It was a huge positive. What God was doing with the nation of Israel was one thing, but he's working with the church. That's a new thing. That's a better thing. And so the book of Hebrews is written, and, and as you're reading it, what you've got to keep in mind is it's a warning as you're leading up to this very important point in history. And it's a warning, don't go back into what you've been doing. Keep going forward in God. Jesus sent them to go into all the world, sent us to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. Somebody left their notes here. And so they had been going forward for those first 35 years. They'd been going forward. They, they were learning as they went. Listen, they were growing a little bit every day, every week, every year. They didn't know everything. They didn't know how to do church. They didn't know how to do Christianity. They weren't sure that it was going to go beyond Jerusalem in the beginning. They knew what Jesus said, but they didn't know how to do it. When they were faced with the Gentile situation, they didn't know what to do. They had to have a council, and, and they had to seek the Holy Spirit to know what to do. They grew a little bit, and when you come to like 65 AD, somebody writes this 13-chapter book and says, listen, I've got a main point for you guys. You got to understand that you're still walking with Jesus. Keep walking with him. Don't turn around and go back. Lots of people were under pressure to go back to the system of Judaism. Back to the Hebrew system. The book of Hebrews, you know, the, the term Hebrews, you know what it means? It means to cross over into a region beyond. It was the name that was attached to Abraham's name just suddenly in Genesis 14. Just suddenly he was called Abraham or Abram, the Hebrew. Well, if you look in the genealogy, it was one of his forefathers' name, a guy named Eber, the same name as Hebrew, and it meant to cross over. So what God started doing in the life of Abraham is what God's always been doing. He's always calling us to go forward. Not to stay, not to stay wherever you are and not to go back to whatever you're comfortable with. Keep going forward in God. Hello? Keep crossing over. See, when God called Abram, that's what he said. Cross over. He told him to cross over. He actually crossed over the Euphrates River to go into the promises of God. He wasn't looking for a city again that was a natural city. He was looking for the city of God, the lost city of God. What God built in the Garden of Eden, right? It's the heavenly dimension operating in the natural sphere quite naturally. Abram was looking for that. When you read the book of Hebrews, you know what happens to you? You get, kind of, you get kind of this idea all the way through of, you know, we're called to go forward and not get stuck. But when you get to the end, the Bible tells you to do the same thing Abraham did. Keep going forward. Don't look for a city here. Listen, it says more than that. It says, go outside the camp. Christians today want to stay in the camp. We're, we're like these people. We're tempted to want to go stay where it's comfortable, stay in what we've been familiar with. But this is that exciting day I started off telling you about. This is the time when, you know, throw off the comfort zone. Somebody's here in the spirit today. This is, this is a very simple sermon, really, you know what I mean? Just, going, just giving you different pointers on how to think about it. But, man, throw off the tendency to want to do it your way. Throw that off. Don't let it creep into your life, your heart, your children, your church. Don't let it cause you to sit down and see, if these guys had listened to that and stayed in the city of Jerusalem, they would have all lost their lives. And you know what? They even ate their children there because they cut off all the supplies. Just waited them out. That's what the Romans did. Just crushed them. Just like Jesus said, not one stone left on another. Just crushed them. But God's people got out. You know what? Because they understood this point. God's calling us to cross over. Always cross over. What is the main point when you get to chapter 8? The main point is we have such a great high priest, man. Jesus is on the job today the way he's always been. 
Remember Paul and Bunny Collins here, they wrote this great little book, you know, about the gospel. I forget what it's called, but it's just it's about the gospel. But it just breaks the gospel down into four simple steps. Jesus died for you. Jesus died as you. Jesus lives in you. Jesus lives through you. That's the gospel. So simple, you know what I mean? But it's hard to get to the lives in you and lives through you if you don't know that he died for you and he died as you. He took you to the cross, not just your sins. You and me went to the cross. He died as us, identified with us completely so that he could give us everything that God has. Then when he rose from the, that's the power of the cross. Then when he rose from the dead, then the Holy Spirit was given to make all that stuff work. Now he lives in you, and it's just a natural thing that he lives through us. But don't we have a hard time trying to figure out how to do it? Is it just me? It's not just me, because I'm 54, and I've been doing this since I was 19. Since I was 18 years old, I got saved. And I've been going to churches, I can tell you, people don't know how to do it. There's the main point right there. We have such a great high priest, not after the order of religion and superstition, but after the heavenly order, the way God made it in the beginning, Jesus went back and took the original plan and made it better. Wow! What's the plan? Order of Melchizedek! Melchizedek's not one name, it's two names, really. Just in the translation, we lose the meaning. It means king of righteousness. God was reigning in the earth from the beginning. There was an order of people who knew God from the very beginning. And Jesus just went back and said, okay, that was broken through sin. And we're going to make sure that's completely, the bridge is completely made intact. So you can walk with him. We're thinking, what's he talking about? Order of Melchizedek. You know, the word order, you know what it means, right? It's like a secret order. Who's running the world today? Secret orders. And they make it so you can't quite figure out who, right? <laughs> like the more you try to figure it out, the less you feel like you know. Because the devil's very, very smart. He got all of his information from God. He knows how to do it in such a way. He knew how to do it to Adam and Eve in a way that they would choose to do it. He knows how to do it. But God's got a higher order. The order of Melchizedek, the order of the king of righteousness, is the order Jesus operates under. And he died to bring back and make it just real to me and you. Still glad you came to church this morning. I don't know when the last time I heard any Christian talk about, you know, praise God, man, the great high priest Jesus, you know, talk to him today. What's he doing anyway? He's at the right hand of God where he ever lives to make intercession. You know what that means? It means he's administrating and managing all the affairs of God, spiritual and natural, from the right hand of God. That's why you and I aren't supposed to do anything on our own. We're supposed to be like him, do it the way he did it. I hear God, I see God, I try to figure, you know, I try to spend time with God and figure out what God's saying and then do it. And then let God actually do it through me instead of doing it myself. It's a higher order. But Jesus today, and it's funny about Jesus because even though we don't know, it's like he waits for us to catch up and figure it out. He's waiting for us to realize today he's at the right hand of the Father, managing everything. You got a problem, he can fix it. He is, he doesn't just have answers, he is the answer. He is the main point. We have such a great high priest, notice this, one who is seated at the right hand of the majestic God in heaven, as officiating priest, verse 2 says, a minister in the holy places, and now listen to this part, in the true tabernacle which is erected not by man, Say it with me, not by man. I hope this is resonating with you today. My, my job is to, to touch people that are a little bit in touch with the call of God. If something in you is like, you know what, God made me for something, and I, I'm, I don't quite have my head wrapped around it yet, but I want to. I'm your guy. I don't have a huge reach or anything like that or a big ministry, but I have potent seed. That kind of, can get a little weird, but you know what I mean? God's seed is potent seed. Did you know the seed of God's word is a heart-seeking missile? 
It always finds its target. That's why sometimes when I'm preaching, I notice some people love it and some people hate it. And the reason that is is because God's Word is finding the target. And when it finds your heart, it will show your heart and my heart to us. And so if you find yourself going, I don't like that guy, it might just be, it could be me, but it might be you. <laughs> huh? It could be me. I make a lot of mistakes. Bobby tells me all the time. You know, I make a lot of mistakes. But it might be you. Because the Bible says the, the Word of God, it's scattered, you know? Like the sower sows the Word, right? Jesus sowing the Word. He is the Word. Wherever He goes, He's not making any mistakes. His Word always comes back, hitting the target. Valid, successful, prospers where it's sent. Doesn't ever come back. Just because you rejected it doesn't mean it came back empty. That was your choice. This thing's powerful. And when it's out there, you can just hear it kind of almost in your subconscious, and it'll find your heart. When I got saved, I got saved that way. It was a surprise to me. I, it was a surprise. People had told me about Jesus, but I never really listened to them. I never spent really five minutes listening to any of them seriously. But I did have something in me that was constantly dealing with me, even as a child, about the fact that Jesus was real. God is real. But I heard in the background the Word of God. I heard it, and it found me, and it worked on me for a number of years. And after I got saved, I looked back, and I was amazed at the miracle of how it worked. What am I saying today? God's Word is working in the church. It's working on you this morning. It's working in your life. Probably didn't need me to preach to you. You probably already got the Word working in you. I'm probably just confirming some things that the Lord's been saying. But you didn't need me to say it. It does the work itself. This way you don't have to work for God. You don't have to work for God. You just have to realize today is the day of opportunity. Enter into the rest. You don't really have to do it. He does it. The work is labor to enter in. The, the work is listen right now. Listen. The guy with the good ground, you know, what he, you know what's different about him than the, the other kinds of ground in the parable of the sower? You do know it. You just might not have thought about it. The difference between him is they heard, they heard, they heard, but he heard and received. He heard, and finally, when it got his attention, he went, wait a minute, what? That's how I got saved. I heard Begley, though, they talked about how he got saved. I was like, I get that, man. I get that supernatural salvation. I'm concerned more Christians don't have that. I, I, I don't always get them. I'm like, listen, God tracked me down, hunted me down, and then nailed me. Like, like got the prey. I know it was up to me. I had to say yes, but he, he was like a dogged. You know what I mean? Like the investigator that gets his man, like Sherlock Holmes, you know. He, it's easy for him, really. And eventually I just went, you know, I've heard all that, but I didn't realize, God, what is it you're saying? And the next thing I know, I was picking myself off the ground, weeping. In worship today, I was crying like that. You see, the big deal today is that God's restoring the tabernacle of David. That's what the church is. It's the tabernacle of the man that had a heart after God. He's like, let's don't do it religiously. Let's just let God do it. Did you know David took the heart and the gut out of the tabernacle of Moses and planted it in the, in the city of Zion in Jerusalem? And it was a worship thing where it was God. They didn't do all the rituals there. They just took the heart of God and said, we're going to do God here. Yes, the tabernacle of Moses was still over there. But the heart of God was transferred into the city of God, into the city of Zion, man. That's what the whole picture of the lost city is about. Church has lost touch with, you know what? God wants to be God. God wants to be the God of our hearts. He wants us to go, oh God, oh, I hear you, Lord. Hold on a minute. I receive. Jesus said, you can speak to that mountain if you don't doubt in your heart, but you believe the things you say will come to pass. You will have whatsoever you say. Therefore... When you pray, believe you receive the things that you're asking for and you will have them. 
I know, like, not everybody can hear this today. This is, I just, I, I'm really sure about this. This is the Holy Spirit this morning. It's a little bit of a wake-up call. It's just, but, you know, it's a healthy thing. You know what I mean? It's kind of like the fear of God. People don't know how to uh, deal with the fear of God today. They're like, well, you know, fear's not a good thing, so we don't have a spirit of fear, the Bible says, but you're supposed to have a healthy fear of God. When you have a fear of God, it doesn't mean you're afraid of God. It means you fear what is bigger than you, and it erases every other fear in your life. As soon as you truly fear God and you're like, God, it's all about you. You're the great high priest. I don't know how you think, and I'm not sure about it. Your ways are so much higher than me. Let me not treat you as common. As soon as you do that, you're like, man, I'm not afraid of anybody. I'm not afraid of anything. I can run in the rainforest with Susie, right? I know there's browns and, you know, whatever else out there, tiger snakes and whatever. Man, I'm walking with God, man. God didn't put me on this plant to get bit by a snake and die, right? Come on, there's something in us this morning that wants to come out. That's what Neil said. Something, that's what Neil always says, isn't it? You see, God doesn't care if you have to hear it a thousand times, if I have to hear it a million times. He doesn't care. He doesn't care if you don't like the sermon. He doesn't care if you don't like the church. He doesn't care if you don't like where it's going, what kind of things they do. He doesn't care. He cares about you. <laughs> and so he'll just make you mad, get you upset, get you all discombobulated, make you feel stuck. He'll do whatever it takes to get to you. I told you, it may not be me. It might be you. <laughs> it might be. How do I close this thing out today? In case you want to hear more about this, there's 20 of these lessons on my podcast. So anyway, on the same topic, but a little bit more detail. When I, when I got here, here's how we're going to close. When I got here, I had this song in my heart, like the first day I was here. And, and this is weird. This is one of those little ways that could get superstitious, but it's not. Just once in a while, God deals with me this way. And at first, I didn't think it was God. I thought it was me. So I had this little 80s song rolling around in my heart. And, and honestly, I thought it was just because I miss Bobby. And it was, that, it was that song from the 80s. You know, some of you that lived through the 80s like I did, you remember that song called, um, I Ain't Missing You At All? Oh, man, it just touches me, you know what I mean? Even when I think, it was just one of those songs. You know, not, a, not a Christian song, just one of those songs, that, you know, because I love my wife, and I'm thinking, oh, when I'm apart from her, you know, I really, sometimes I want to be all tough, like, I'm not missing you, but I'm always missing her. Always missing her. So when I got here, I had this song kept coming up, you know? So I was at Neil and Nan's house, you know? I'd be in the bathroom, and I'm saying, I'm not missing you at all. And I'd be like, ooh, I just need to be quiet. They'll think I'm crazy in here. <laughs> Since you've been gone. Away, I'm a terrible singer. And I was just kind of getting into it, you know, because I, I was kind of there back in the day. And somewhere along the week, you know, I was taking these runs with Susie and I was doing my thing. Somewhere during the week, I started to realize, you know, God's done this bit with me before. And, and sometimes when I have a little jingle, a little heart, a little uh, song, it's something God's saying to my heart. He's trying to get me to stop and, and like ask him, well, like, what are you doing? And so this morning in worship, it all came to me. I said, oh, man, I get it. I just started crying over there, you know, for no reason, really, other than Jesus is a great high priest. He's building a tabernacle. It's not the man-made one. Forget about the man-made. Get out of the man-made tabernacle for crying out loud. What are you doing? You cannot serve God and mammon. You can't go to church and be the church. You've either got to be the church or go to church. If you're going to church, you're still a baby Christian, by the way. If you need somebody to always pray for you, if you need somebody to always run to, it doesn't mean we don't all need that at times, but if you need it all the time, you see, it's speaking to our heart. God's like, man, you are a David, brother. You've got a lion killer in you, a bear killer, a giant killer. Most Christians, they don't even know what a giant was. You get a freaky, angelic, weird hybrid thing. You're going to kill it, not fall and bow to it in the last days. Not be deceived by it and think, oh, that might be Jesus. It's not. It's fake Jesus. A lot of the church today is fake church. Be careful. A lot of the preaching is fake preaching. Be careful. You've got to know the voice for yourself. 
So anyway, back to the song. I'm singing the song, and all of a sudden I realized today, I said, that's just God's heart for us. He just wants us to know this is, this is where you don't know you've been. You've had this attitude, you didn't realize you had it, that you don't really need God that way. You're not really missing God. You kind of like the Bible and everything, but you're not, you're not really missing God at all. But see, we just never thought about it like that in your conscious thinking. It's like me before I got saved. I just ran through here a few times, but I never grabbed it so I could receive it. God's saying today, grab it today. Grab what God's saying today. Not what the preacher's saying. Grab what God's saying today. Grab what the Bible says today. The main point is this. God wants to be God. God's building a tabernacle that's way bigger than man. Let God do what he wants to do, and he's going to change this world. He's going to flip it upside down one more time. He's going to. It's nothing for him. You see, a lot of times that's what we do. We put on that. I'm not really, you know, we're not saying it with this mind or we would stop it, but we're saying it in our heart. We're saying it with our lifestyle. We don't know. We don't know if we really want that. We're okay with this. We're okay with this. Synthetic. You know what I mean? You know when you have a really good quality shirt, you just, man, I just wear that shirt all the time. And I go into my closet and, I, and when I'm looking for a shirt, I'm like, oh man, I just love that shirt right there because it's so quality. It feels so good. And then once in a while, I say, well, I can't wear it every day, so let me have one of this other shirt. But that's a synthetic shirt. It's okay. But it's not real. It's made for wicking the sweat away or something. You know, it does something. But it's not really the real thing, and it doesn't feel the same. I'm missing God a little bit today. Let's stand up. Praise you, Father. Come on, just open your heart. Just put your hands up. Come on, whatever. You know, or don't do it. If, it, if, it's, if it's a blockage, don't do it. Don't do it to just be doing it, but open yourself before the Lord this morning if you can. Hallelujah. Jesus, Jesus. Oh, rebe shandola kore basate randore bakashibre. Mandare bashai ara bashai shandala kore mendi ara basi o steberi ara hai endele kushombranda la basura Praise you Lord Praise you Lord You know there's this verse in the Bible that says it's according to the power that works in us I call on that power this morning Lord God the power of the Holy Ghost that works in us in the Greek, it's actually the word energy. The energy of the Holy Ghost this morning. I call on that, Lord God. Let it run through this place. Let it run through hearts. Let it run through lives, Father God. I'm going to tell you right now, I sense there's some of us here that this is going to happen to you like you're going to take it home with you. You're going to take home like an ongoing encounter with the Lord. He's going to talk to you tomorrow and the next day and next week. He's starting something today, and he's going to continue it. Let him do it. I call on the power of God this morning to be released in your life. Right now in this church, Father, that the seed of the word of God would not only be heard, but be received in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Father. Thank you. Give me a little extra time this morning. I'm sorry it's taking a little bit extra time. Sometimes it takes me some time. Receive the energy of the Holy Ghost this morning in your life. You know what the Lord showed me? Like when, you, when Paul had those prayer claws, you know, he was preaching and laboring. Somehow somebody stumbled upon the fact that claws could be touching him and then taken to someone and it would drive out sicknesses and drive out spirits of infirmity. The tangible thing that the Lord is doing here this morning, grab it and take it. In that same way, grab it and take it. Receive what the Lord is saying and doing. Receive the energy of the Holy Ghost this morning. Take it back to wherever you're at, wherever you live, whatever family member needs that. Take it and give it. 
Hallelujah. Come on, Lord, you're a great high priest. We worship you and praise you. Give you glory and honor. Thank you, Father. Jesus, you're the head. We're your body. Have your way in this place. Hallelujah. Jesus' name. Pastor. Shakabundi. Amen. Rocky will be back next Sunday here again. Rocky, just come. You, you, you said something there that uh, I don't know how you said it, but uh, but like it was a. Uh, how did you? I can't remember how you put it. That you're something. You are a. <laughs> who remembers what he said but but he's talking about that you were a, like a, a I'm going to say catalyst or you had a, a like a burn the Andes and, and and there are I just sense that there are people here that are in their in their call here for the call of God that are unsettled and not really knowing, but I, be I believe in the impartation. You know that, don't you? The laying on of hands. I believe. I, I believe in people responding. I believe that sometimes it, it's not the prayer or the laying on of hands. Even it's just the the fact that you responded. That it breaks something. Breaks a catalyst. Breaks something over your life that's held you bound and, and if you're those people and there's not one there's many and you'd like to just first of all just make that step step out and, and I love that bit where it's always cross over and that's why I, I, I say and we have an altar call in this church every Sunday basically because in doing it, it's like stepping out of, going into something, crossing over something. And God sees your heart, but it's a call. It's a call. I'd love for Rocky to be able to just pray for you this morning. We're just going to, let me just say it this way. Well, just, yeah, it's, it's just that feeling like that's what I was trying to say. You just been, you've been missing God. That's what that song was doing in my heart. It was letting me remember that I'm missing the Lord a little bit. I'm missing Him. I'm hungry and I do, I love Him and I want more of Him and I didn't realize it and I, I need that. And that's what it is. Like the catalyst for you to step into whatever God has for you. Just respond to that. Are you missing God today? There's something in you that's just missing God a little bit. Right? Let's just, come. Let's, let's just start to worship. Let's just worship. Let's just come and play your instruments. Wouldn't it be but I could he be but under the shut eye?